Hey folks, welcome to the supplementary video for the Cyber Spoon project. If you're here for the fancy machining that is in my other video, I'll link to that in the description below. Um, but here I wanted to just take a couple minutes to talk through the CAD and CAM for the design of this project, um, just because I think it deserves a little more time to breathe. Um, but I also know that a lot of people aren't really interested in the Fusion 360 deep dive, so that's why I'm making this a second video. So uh, let's get started. Um, I am going to roll back the timeline and we'll just walk through this part from the beginning. Uh, so this is a completely parametric um, CAD model and I have predefined a lot of parameters like the size of the spoon bowl, the, uh, the greenhouse angle of my cyber spoon, shell thickness, uh, how thick the spoon is going to be, the diameter of the end mill I'm going to use to finish this uh, model, which is important because there are some fillets that we need the cutter to be able to get into. So I'm going to make sure that the radius of that fillet is greater than the radius of my end mill. I also have a couple parameters for the size of my handle and also what diameter indexing pin I'm using. So if you have access to um, the design files, if you're a Patreon supporter or you purchase the model off uh, my website, um, this is basically all the knobs that you can play with in order to modify the um, results. All right, so first sketch that we're doing is the side profile. Uh, this sketch is upside down because this is a spoon and I want the concave side to be up, but uh, it makes more sense viewed like this. Uh, this is constrained with proportions. Um, so Cybertruck, being a very angular uh, vehicle, it's got some very sharp, strong lines, and you want to keep those ratios um, to, to make this look um, as close to the real thing as possible. So let me slide this over. Um, so the I have a couple parameters like the height of the nose versus the height of the quote-unquote tailgate. Uh, the nose is 40% of the overall height of the spoon. The tailgate is about 55%. Uh, I have 15 degree angles here and here, which is not true to the Cybertruck. The Cybertruck could not be machined uh, entirely from the top because there are some uh, overhangs. Um, so this uh, basically goes past vertical, it's past 90 degrees, and loops back around under the vehicle. I can't do that um, undercut on my CNC. I, I could. This is going to be a two-sided machine part. But for simplicity, I want to define the entire concavity um, from machining from the, the top side, so like this. So um, the apex of the um, greenhouse is 40% of the length, and these uh, parameters, these ratios, will always stay fixed. So if I make this longer or shorter or fatter or narrower, uh, the the proportions of it will stay the same. We'll extrude that out. Um, this extrusion is half the width of the spoon. I'm modeling this as a half because as I sculpt and carve this, I don't want to do duplicate work. Um, some of these cuts that are coming in um, aren't fully symmetrical or well they they're applied to one side of the vehicle i don't want to model both halves of that cut um, it just removes a little bit of duplicate work so here what i'm doing is i'm creating a, a construction plane that is perpendicular to this face so i can sculpt away the area where the uh, the headlight blade uh, terminates. So if you look from the top down, the Cybertruck, or even from the uh, front quarter view, there is sort of a chamfered edge here. And that chamfer is important because the line that goes across the body of the Cybertruck, it ends at the tailgate and it starts at the corner of that headlight. It doesn't start down here at the front of the nose of the vehicle, it starts up at the corner of the taillight. So that needs to be defined before we can sculpt the top half of the cyber spoon. Technically the bottom half, but you get the point. Um, so I need to create a perpendicular plane uh, to this front face so I can punch through and establish um, that little chamfer. Uh, this 
plane was created by, uh, give me a second, using a little piece of sketch geometry. So when I'm defining the front edge, I have a little uh, construction line, 90 degrees off the nose of the spoon. And from, let me hide that sketch and hide that plane again. So from this line and the front edge, we have two lines. Two lines define a plane or three points, but in this case, I'm constructing a plane through two edges. That's what creates the construction plane here that I am sketching that uh, little front end uh, for the headlight, uh, basically extruded cut. So that gets extruded through here. That determines this. Uh, I create a new sketch um, that goes between this point over here to the back tailgate. And after that, I can create a 90 degree, uh, a perpendicular line. That line and this, um, the sort of the tailgate area of this spoon, uh, that feels weird to say. Um, those two lines will define a new construction plane uh, right here. And if I sketch on this, I can create uh, this area to sort of sweep my cut through. And that is going to define the greenhouse of this car. Um, so you can see that this plane, it terminates perfectly where the, uh, the headlight chamfer would be. And that's how I get the overall shape of the body. Uh, now, this is, of course, only half of a uh, cyber spoon truck thing, so I'm going to mirror both halves of it, and I'm going to fuse these two bodies, because right now this presents as uh, two different distinct bodies. So I'll use the modify combine feature here, and that'll just merge these two together. And then let's we'll see what's, what's next. All right, so uh, once we have this volume, we need to turn it into a spoon. And there's a couple different ways um, this shell operation can be used, and only one of them produces the desired result. So if you select a face for shelling, um, it will make basically the edges of that shell terminate on that face. If you select a body, like if I hover like near two vertices, um, and then I shell inward, I'm going to switch to a wireframe view, and you can see that it, it basically just makes it hollow, um, but it doesn't open up the uh, the volume to the outside. So I want a shell based on a face. Uh, so I pick this this bottom face, and this is now open um, to the world. And now we can actually make a spoon out of this. Uh, the next thing I'll do is I'll go in here and I'll add in some fillets because a round cutting tool can't really make all these sharp corners. And to prevent any any hard transitions, like if a CNC has to come in here with a round end mill and try and make a really sharp turn to get as close to these lines as possible, <clears throat> it's going to, uh, if there's any run out in the tool or if there's any deflection, it's actually going to leave little uh, indents or, or cutting marks in these walls. So the fillet that I'm adding here uh, just helps make that less prevalent. It, it's just a good practice to make sure your corners uh, that you're entering have a radius that's, I like to do at least 15 to 25 percent larger than the radius of your cutter. Um, so I've just applied fillets to all the hard edges um, before, after, and so that's the interior done. Uh, from the outside, I have a handle that I'm going to make. This again is done with proportions. So if I edit this sketch, um, it's sort of a, a coffin shape. Um, the edges and the, the bounds of the tapered areas are all uh, multiple of the uh, length of the handle. So if you change the length of the handle, this proportion stays the same. If you want to change the chamfer angles or whatnot, you can adjust how these taper by adjusting the proportions. Uh, you can see here that I am still thinking in imperial fractions, even though this is designed completely in metric. Um, so this here, it tapers in to 25% of the width of the handle. This is 15%. Uh, there's a little gap here, and I'll explain why momentarily um, this handle will be extruded out to the 
uh, parameter that defines the handle thickness. And then I'm also going to do one more thing to make this feel good in the hand, even though this is a completely impractical spoon I will never use, is to put a little bevel on the bottom edge. So when your fingers curl under this, this is actually surprisingly comfortable. Um, now one other thing I am doing, because this is version 2 and I've learned from my mistakes, is that I'm going to use the push-pull, or the offset tool, uh, press-pull, and uh, bring in this face and bring in this face. Because this is end grain, so it is notoriously weak uh, in certain uh, directions of shear, and this handle coming into this face is um, a pretty big weak spot. Uh, so by thickening up these areas, you can make this stronger. Now I want the other edges of this spoon to be as thin as possible so that it uh, you can scoop into material with less resistance, but because this is end grain, I do have to add a little more here just to prevent it from blowing out, especially when you have a uh, 18,000 RPM cutting tool uh, just nicking away at this edge. So front and back, all the end grain sides have to be reinforced. Uh, next up is extruding. So to bring the handle to the uh, body of the spoon, um, you could do this uh, one or two ways. Um, if, you, if you take this face, and then I'm going to switch to wireframe view, control 7, um, and you bring it in so that it's contacting the body of the spoon, uh, you have to overshoot this um, so that the handle is completely... Um, merged with the spoon. Now, if this wall were thinner, you might get uh, parts of that handle overshooting into the interior of the spoon. The way around this um, is to not extrude by a distance, but actually extrude to an object. So I select this face, and then that merges the handle seamlessly with the surface of the spoon. So that is the next operation. Um, and then here, again, to reduce the sharp corners that are impossible to machine, I'm going to uh, add in some fillets. So these fillets, again, are defined as a percentage of the end mill radius. So end mill diameter divided by 2 gets us radius times 1.25. So this radius is 25% larger than the radius of the uh, end mill we're using. Okay, uh, next up is a patch that I don't actually use um, because I realized that the best way to create a placeholder volume inside this is to take a sketch of the that spoon opening and extrude that. That gets us body 5, uh, which just goes through the spoon. And then you can use the split body tool down here in the modify menu to uh, base all pull that up actually so you can see the uh, what it prompts you for. It prompts you for a body to split, so that's body 5, and then it prompts you for a splitting tool that is the cyber spoon itself. So if you do that, you end up um, with body 5 being split into whatever is extra on the outside and the volume of the spoon itself. And once you have this, you can just right click on that, go to properties, and you have the volume of that body. So I use this to calibrate my spoon to within like 1% of one tablespoon. If you have some heaping on the spoon or you don't level it perfectly, it'll change. So this is close enough for me. Um, I'll add that volume, bring the spoon back. Uh, so because this is parametric, if your um, interior volume isn't to your uh, exact specification, you can go in, you can modify the spoon length, spoon width, whatever, I could make this 65 millimeters long, hit enter, and the spoon gets longer, I could make this an absurdly long spoon, uh, it, it doesn't matter. And the volume updates uh, automatically in this model. So let me just undo that parameter change. And, uh, okay, so I'm doing a little more cleanup here. I'm using the remove uh, function to just clean up some of the extra bodies I don't need. If you right click on any body and you hit delete, sometimes it causes problems because um, 
something on it was referenced previously in history and now it's gone. The remove is just much less problematic from a timeline maintenance uh, perspective. So use remove, don't use delete if you can avoid it. Um, there is an, a construction plane that I added out here to model tabs. And the tabs are done in a way that they are also parametric uh, or related to the parameters that define the spoon. So if I go out here, I've got the, the tab width is pretty much fixed. I can make that a ratio of the spoon length if I want, but it's positioned in such a way that it's in the middle of the spoon. Uh, the middle tab is positioned in a way that it's always some, uh, 10 millimeters past the end of the spoon bowl. And then this tab back here is positioned so that it is um, four millimeters inset from this flat face. If you're trying to cut off a tab and then clean it up, and you're trying to sand uh, using this face as a reference, you're probably gonna like sand this at a slight angle or something, or you're gonna round over some of these edges. Um, it's not great. It's better if you just put both of these tabs on this face, so you have a single flat reference uh, that you're working towards, and that's just, it's a lot easier for any manual cleanup you have to do later. All right, extrude out all of these tabs and then uh, mirror them so they're on both sides. And then the last thing I do is I put in a sketch for my indexing pins. So I've got a containment and indexing sketch. The containment sketch uh, is basically just a projection of the body and then you offset it uh, four millimeters and that gives you a containment region for some of the toolpaths we're going to do momentarily. Um, and then when I extrude out the pin bores, that just shows me uh, where the indexing pins are going to go, and it gives me a circular face I can target with a boring operation. All right, ready to go to the manufacturing workspace. All right, so um, what we're doing here, first op, is going to be uh, machining the sort of the bottom of the spoon. I always want to start here because this is where the majority of the material removal happens. And once you flip it over and you start machining away and you expose the tabs, that's all that's going to be left holding your model in place. So do the majority of your material removal first, because in OP2, I had to cut back. Uh, the depth of cut on the pocketing operation is half of uh, what it was in OP1. So here, uh, 3D pocketing toolpath. Um, which, oh, let me circle back for a second. In this setup, um, to create the stock volume, I'm only referencing the spoon itself. Um, doesn't have to be that way, that's just the way I set it up, um, but it's important for the pocketing toolpath um, to at least know that the tabs are part of the model. So here I've just selected everything in the Cyberspoon project, um, but if you're trying to contain the toolpath using the model, if you go with a silhouette, uh, the pocketing toolpath isn't going to give you what you want. It's going to go around the tabs, uh, which is not ideal. What we really want to do is we want to bound it to the uh, region immediately around the spoon itself, ignoring the tabs. The toolpath will still move around the tabs, um, but it's going to stay close to the spoon and not just escape and go all the way around these tabs. So using that chain, uh, the sketch geometry as a containment boundary, we can keep the toolpath working exactly where we want it. Same thing with this 3D contouring uh, operation. I'm using a 3D contour to just finish all the walls and automatically move around the tabs, but any vertical face is much easier to finish with a square end mill. So while I still have my quarter inch down cutting end mill, I'll touch up these flat faces. Then I'll switch to a parallel toolpath, eighth inch ball nose end mill. And I have it set to avoid the uh, side windows here um, because steep faces that are uh, sort of in the same direction or parallel to the direction of your parallel finish are gonna give you a lot of uh, scallop marks. Uh, so it's not, not the best way to hit these. Um, instead, here, here, I'll actually just, um, 
undo my avoid touch thing so you can see what that toolpath looks like. So you can see on these faces, um, the resolution of this toolpath is not great. I don't know how well you can see that. I'll just zoom in all the way. Um, on every other face, uh, like going this way, you have very tight spacing of the lines, but because of the slope of this face, it just it's the lines get further and further apart. So I'm using a 3D contour toolpath to fix that um, and make sure that you don't have so many uh, machining marks on these faces and there's much less cleanup to do. And then the last part of my Op1 setup is to use that same eighth inch ball nose end mill and just machine the pinholes for indexing later. You could use a square end mill, um, but I just overshoot the depth that I need uh, with the ball end mill so that radius at the end and the fillet that gets that ends up in the bottom of this hole doesn't matter. Flipping this part over, we have a 3D pocketing toolpath. The step down is half of what it was previously because all that's holding this spoon in place are these tabs. Um, and also, the walls of this spoon are getting quite thin, and if you take too aggressive a cut, it's just going to explode. Uh, so 3D pocketing there, a 2D pocketing toolpath um, targeting the face of the spoon, uh, just to clean up all the flat reference surfaces, um, and then a scallop toolpath. So this doesn't have the same issues as the parallel toolpath, even on the vertical faces, on the shallow faces, the spacing of the toolpath is identical. Uh, so that's the good thing about scallop. It's just not necessarily um, good to apply to uh, surfaces that are hard to bound. Like I wouldn't know uh, when to stop it like from here to here, it'll do something funky. Um, so I like to just limit it to a single concavity or a single convex structure at a time. And then I just have the pin boring operation broken out as a separate um, toolpath so I can just export this setup and machine pinholes into my wasteboard. So that is the uh, sort of the behind the scenes look at how the Cyberspoon CAD and CAM is done. I uh, hope you found this helpful. If you if any parts of this were confusing, let me know so that I can present this better next time. Um, but until then, uh, if you have any questions, just shoot me a DM on Instagram or Twitter. Um, good luck and have fun machining, folks.